Okay, I would like to thank Sepeda uh, and David Roden for inviting me to introduce a new context for part of my research, uh, my dissertation research, which I hope you'll find useful. Uh, first, I would like to preface what I will discuss with how I will discuss it. So here are a few comments about method. Now, um, I am uh, not a real philosopher, although I do occasionally play one on TV like today. Uh, my background is in literary theory and science studies, uh, which means that I've read philosophy, of course, but I'm not trained in the way that David Roden, Anna Longo, Ray Brazier, and Reza Naragastani and Stefan Sorner demonstrate. What I do as a cultural historian is to examine scientific concepts as they pervade net transdisciplinary networks and manifest in particular works of philosophy in the arts. The aim is simply to interrogate their transdisciplinary drift and to borrow Isabel Stenger's concept to evaluate their cosmopolitical import. In other words, how metaphors suggest models and worldviews. So I take seriously the exhortation by Gilles Deleuze to forge alliances transversally among scientific percepts, philosophical concepts, and artistic constructs. I go about this through an imminent rhetoric of tropes and Jean-Baptiste de Vico, Friedrich Nietzsche, Walter Benjamin, Kenneth Burke, Harold Bloom, Jacques Derrida, Michel Serre, and Hayden White are tactical precursors. While, while acknowledging Deleuze's antipathy towards metaphor because of its taint by identity and transcendence, despite he, uh, his insisting on forging alliances, I've argued that one must have recourse to and can recuperate metaphor and tropes more generally by shifting focus from the rep representation of things to that of processes in order to explore the implications of how we humans have modeled those processes based on fundamental assumptions. Another resource for me has been how the philosophy of science addresses scientific models as extensions of meta uh, metaphoricity, exemplified by the famous collection on metaphor and thought by Artoni, especially my revised version of Richard Boyd's theory constitutive metaphor or a TCM by which tropes, uh, tropes and, or metaphors participate naively or ironically in their own epistemological baggage. We must also acknowledge the role that power plays in these tropical networks, for as Michel Serre says, science is on the side of power. It has and will have more credit and more intellectual legitimacy. It will take up space. I also want to highlight what Peter Gallison would call the agency of tropes and models in shaping cognition, much as tools do in transdisciplinary trading zones where scientific tropes carry that weight and have that power. I began this approach in my dissertation 32 years ago by addressing the epistemological and ideological behaviors of tropical systems derived from time reversible and time irreversible models of physical systems in order to understand the polemical stance of avant-garde tactics in opposition to cultural hegemonies, whether scientific, economic, political, or aesthetic. I argue that the avant-garde strain of modernism situates itself polemically against dominant culture by recourse to tropes of time irreversible systems in opposition to tropes reversible systems with special reference to the concept of emergence or self-organization. Then I extended this line of inquiry to minoritarian aesthetics and the politics of cultural marginality, for example, with jazz, critical race theory and cognition. One source for this strain of critical modernism can be found in part in Nietzsche's identification of truth with inertia in human all to human, a feature of dynamical systems modeled by means of reversible systems addressing, for example, the role of gravity in, in the solar system or in the behavior of machines. In other words, truth stabilized by the law of least action, so to speak. We should remain alert to the appearance of correspondences between physical thought systems here. I suggest, for example, that the role of probability in decision making, as discussed by Anna Longo, was anticipated by the invention of phase space as a geometry of virtual futures mapped by recourse to the mathematics of probability 
and may be an inspired construction such as given the, the remarkable similarity of the equation for Boltzmann's order principle describing entropy in a closed system in, in thermodynamics and Shannon's equation for noise in an information channel. The theme of this series of talks for foreign object is the role of complexity and probability in the discourses of posthumanism. And these terms refer to this particular moment in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, where the anomalies of irreversible thermodynamic processes, which are both complex and require the mathematics of probability to capture, began to challenge the predominance of precise, reversible dynamical system systems with which the discipline of physics still persists with identifying and which the deployment of calculus and, and as extensions in such, in such things as Hamiltonian equations exemplify. The feminist philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, helped to exfoliate the insight of physicist and chemist Ilya Prigogine that his Nobel Prize work on the role of irreversible time in self-organizing processes far from equilibrium was part of a much larger challenge to the hegemony of reversible time, challenging that hegemony by decentering physics and its mathematics by considering that time reversible perspective a form of cognitive bias. Prigogine's work began during World War II in Brussels and is one member of a genealogy of scientists, mathematicians, and philosophers insisting on the need for a mathematics that could account for irreversible time and the evolution, first from order to disorder and then from disorder to order of physical systems. I'm speaking of Henri Bergson and Bergson's dissertation, De Donder, and De Donder's dissertation director, Henri Poincaré, who was Bergson's mentor. The title of Prigogine's monograph, From Being to Becoming, from 1980, was accompanied by a more uh, accessible polemic co-authored with Isabel Stengers, Order Out of Chaos, Man's New Dialogue with Nature, came out in French in 1979 and in English in 1984. The French edition of which actually contains a, a large section on Stenger's uh, mentor, Gilles Deleuze. This line of inquiry became addressed more thoroughly in Stenger's masterwork, Cosmopolitics 1 and 2 from 2010 and 2011. Stenger's locates the arena for this debate in the factitious, which is a conflation of the word fact and fetish of scientific invention including both objects and models, from the problematic status of the neutrino in which the modes of observation hold hostage the cognition of scientists as those scientists attempt to grab, grasp its facticity, which Stengers calls reciprocal capture, to the inherent cognitive bias of Western mathematics towards the reversible model of time. A, a bias challenged by the intuitionist school in mathematics of Kronecker, Poincaré, Brouwer, and others beginning in the late 19th century. These two competing, uh, these competing paradigms of reversible and irreversible time also seem to play a role in the shift from a disembodied computational deterministic model of cognition exemplified by John von Neumann from which comes game theory as addressed by Anna Longo to a contingently emergent model of embodied and inactive cognition exemplified by the work of Francisco Varela and others. So the critique posed by Prigogine and Stengers is a very deep one indeed, which may explain how responses to uh, their work, often measured by both indifference and hostility, one might suggest are symptomatic of normal science where cognitive biases remain opaque rather than transparent. So let us review some basic concepts. By reversible time, I referred to the dynamical model of spatialized time by recourse to infinitesimal calculus invented by Newton and Leibniz used to describe physical forces, the, uh, forces, the laws of which make sense whether the system moves forwards or backwards in time like the motion of planets and comets or the interaction of subatomic particles um, reversible, deterministic, and precise, these laws became applied with great success from astronomy 
and weapons ballistics to the design of the reversible mechanics of steam engines controlling the irreversible processes of heat to produce work, which in turn drive the industrial revolution. With the power to enable humans to control nature, the reversible model of time exemplified by calculus proves helpless, however, in accounting for or even observing living systems, not to mention the capacity to conceptualize the laws that govern them. Here, for example, is a model of Feynman diagrams of subatomic particle in interactions, which make sense forwards or backwards in time. A photon shaking apart into an electron positron pair with the electron moving forwards, the positron moving backwards in time, or the electron positron pair colliding, producing a photon. In this diagram, an electron and positron exist simultaneously in three places at the same time and three places in the same place. As that is a good example of my interest in the drift of these metaphors into, for example, the arts. Here's a, um, a discovery of mine, um, a, a time reversible map of the events uh, of and the character interactions uh, in Gravity's Rainbow, uh, dealing with both um, um, uh, the behavior of nation states and the behavior of individual characters. Irreversible time. Uh, becomes conceptualized during the Industrial Revolution, initially to address engineering problems that arose from observing the inefficiencies and vulnerabilities of heat engines, which are the boundary conditions and macroscopic parameters in what becomes the subdiscipline within physics called equilibrium thermodynamics. In contrast with the reversible properties of deterministic dynamic systems, the thermodynamic anomaly of contingent irreversible time moves toward the future only. This anomaly, which remains for many scientists a parenthesis in the history of physics, or relegated to the status of a problem of phenomenology for human beings, becomes exemplified by the behaviors of entropic processes like heat dissipation or the oxidation of machinery with engineers observing that the evolution of these systems actually degrade over time. In other words, the internal combustion engine eventually loses power from the dissipation of heat caused by inefficiency with respect to its boundary conditions or its macro macroscopic parameters. The engine will no longer generate work. Its mechanisms will break down from friction. The Ferrari will turn into a pile of rust, but that pile of rust can never remember what it's like to be a Ferrari. Contrasting dynamical systems, contingent and irreversible complex processes like heat contained by an engine in a closed system to perform work can only be accounted for by the use of statistical probability. Now, the impossibility of calculus to track by means, um, uh, 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 by tracking by means of calculus, the distinct trajectories of each of billions of atoms or molecules in a gas or fluid or electrons through conducting metal requires re recourse to forms of mathematics and geometry that can compute the probabilities to account for the behavior of the system as a whole. But as Ludwig Boltzmann recognized in his order principle, the irreversibility of entropic processes will not inevitably, but rather move most probably toward greater disorder. The slide possibility for order to emerge toward greater orderliness exists, and this is the portal that Bergson and then Prigogine jumped through. The geometry of phase space proves crucial in being able to visualize uh, applying and then juxtaposing coalitions of mathematical equations from distinct subdivisions in physics and chemistry necessary to account for the role of time in unfolding simultaneous behaviors found in complex systems. Created by Riemann, Poincaré, Einstein, Gibbs, and others, phase space is a form of smooth geometry capable of modeling the behavior through time of both reversible and irreversible systems distinct from the striated geometry of calculus and its extension through Hamiltonian equations. But it is pointedly able to see phenomena, phase space is able to see phenomena that the striations of calculus cannot. 
the recourse to phase space highlights the necessity for a new mathematics uh, capable of addressing complex emergent, especially living systems in ways impossible by means of calculus. The need for this new mathematics to account for duration and emergence was first intuited by Bergson in his prescient creative evolution, which came out uh, in, in 1907. He said, we believe that if biology could ever get as close to its object as mathematics does to its own, it would become to the physics and chemistry of organized bodies, what the mathematics of moderns has proved to be in relation to ancient geometry. The wholly superficial displacements of masses and molecules studied in physics and chemistry would become, by relation to that inner vital movement, which is transformation and not translation, what the position of a moving object is to the movement of that object in space. The experiments with new forms of mathematics developed by Prigogine and his collaborators that began during World War II sought to formalize those intuitions. The, mathemat the mathematics for the modeling of irreversible emergent processes continues to evolve today, as Prigogine could not possibly have contemplated this, uh, could not have completed this monumental project, which he helped to initiate, although N. Catherine Hales and others have criticized him for not completing that project. Since Prigogine, however, Further work towards a new mathematics addressing contingency, irreversibility, and emergence have come from Chris Jarzinski, uh, uh, Gavin Crooks, Jeremy England, and even more recently by both mathemat and mathematicians and scientists working in physics and chemistry. Now, emergence. Emergence or self-organization, I will use these concepts interchangeably for now, refers to both mathematically theorized and empirically researched natural and artificial processes by which order appears spontaneously out of disorder. Prigogine was the first to postulate in a rigorous way that the principles of self-organization, uh, uh, self derived initially from non-equilibrium thermodynamics and premised on an irreversible perspective towards time, drives all living systems. Working with teams of collaborators, Prigogine also conceptualized how the attributes of self-organizing processes, particularly the role of bifurcation in the emergence of dissipated structures far from equilibrium, can be extrapolated from physics and chemistry and biology to social and cybernetic systems, biological and ecological systems, then into cognitive science and computer science. Prigogine's team sought, to fur sought further evidence of bifurcations in low temperature physics, for example, in phase transitions, in the behaviors of particles in the quantum field, which he uses for which he uses the word fluctuations, changes in insect populations under environmental stress, and even with traffic flows and historical processes of urbanization in human civilization. Prigogine sought to demonstrate that bifurcation signal not only that irreversible and reversible processes coexist, but as Felix Guattari emphasizes, uh, but that time's irreversibility underlies all physical phenomena. As, as Felix Guattari puts it, the same entitative uh, multiplicities constitute virtual unices, uh, universes and possible worlds. This, potential, this potentiality of finite sensible bifurcation inscribed in an irreversible temporality remains in absolute reciprocal presupposition with a temporal reversibility, the, incorpor the incorporeal in eternal return of infinitude. That's from uh, the new aesthetic paradigm in chaosmosis. Bifurcation refers to the moment of singular instability in the contingent history of a complex system by which alternative futures for the entire system become apparent and which are instrumental to emergent processes. We can think of these alternatives as forks in the road with a nod to pension, unfolding spontaneously for that system. Bifurcations in phase space thus visualize the range of possible futures for the entire system and are modeled by dots on a graph representing one possible future with an ensemble of dots indicating the horizon of possible futures at a particular moment, 
often circulated, uh, often circled to indicate the range of, uh, of outcomes in a continuous evolution at a particular moment in time. Here's a, a, a phase space diagram of time evolution in phase space of a gaseous, a gaseous volume uh, uh, in the context of equilibrium thermodynamics. The mathematics of bifurcating systems and their philosophical implications have now become deployed to account for emergent processes in so many distinct disciplines from the hard to the human sciences that just by itself, the empirical, verifi the empirical verification of the influence of concept of the influential concept of bifurcation integrated in part with nonlinear mathematical models, which Alan Turing used to describe morphogenesis in 1952, has ensured Prigogine's legacy. But it is his investigations into the role of bifurcations in dissipative structures far from equilibrium, which Prigogine receives the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1977. Now I'm gonna run through these slides quickly. Here are, here's a, a sample of a simple bifurcation and a, an example of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, excuse me, I've got to go back a page, um, uh, uh, to um, a cascading bifurcations in phase space. Uh, here is an example of, of, of the self-organizing dissipative structures in phase space. Uh, of the beloshov zabotinsky reaction, the empirical discoveries in 1958 and, 19, and confirmed in 1964 also confirmed uh, the predictions from these equations from Turing and Prigogine. Here's an example of phase space employed uh, in the history of urbanization. Here, the model of, of the role of chance factors play in producing symmetry breaking po population aggregations and economic growth. Here, for example, is Francisco um, Varela utilizing phase space diagrams and to plot the cascading um, uh, bifurcations of a grand mal seizure. Okay, so one part of this polemical transformation requires a foundation challenge to the epistemological stance required a timeless transcendence in mathematics that enabled control of diamond, uh, dynamical systems through calculus. In other words, it cuts the ground out from under the being of Pythagoras and the, transcendent, uh, the transcendent observer in calculus, and of course, the subject-object duality of Descartes. It turns out that these two grand narratives from being and to becoming and from duality to univocality seems to inform, inform a number of discourses of posthumanism. So I think it might be useful to examine very briefly these posthuman grand narratives in light of these earlier tropical polemics, particularly in the terms of the role that technology plays in complicating these two narratives. Here, I will refer briefly to the work of David Roden and Stefan Sorgner. I am putting aside for the moment reflections on the significance of Patricia McCormick's powerful and fearless extinction thesis, which really deserves separate treatment. And I encourage you all uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, dip into her work, uh, which is uh, only now unfolding with a book just re uh, recently released and, and another one coming very soon. So now I'd like to talk about um, Sorg, uh, Roden, Sorgner, and technology, post-human grand narratives. And this is just going to be brief. Despite the slight differences in their classifications of post-human phil uh, philosoph uh, philosophizing, David Roden and Stefan Sorgner diverge when Sorgner seems to identify two grand narratives informing the role of te technology in the shift from humanism to post or meta-humanism from being to becoming and from subject object dualism to univocality or hybridity or disconnection. And I suggest uh, looking at chapter three in his recent philosophy of post-human art for his discussion of grand narratives. David uh, Roden's fictional speculations in Snuff Memories, on the other hand, in my mind, hilariously envision a post-human future without either. And uh, uh, my talk, um, uh, through um, uh, foreign object is, is available online. 
Actually, uh, one can conceive of permutations of these two narratives, such as imagining a disembodied machine intelligence, or even a hybrid fusion of subjective bio and objective machine intelligence capable of becoming, here meaning self-organization. As early as the 1970s, the theorization of John Holland in his adaptation in natural and artificial systems, as well as Winogrand and Flores, um, uh, Maturana and, uh, and Varela inspired understanding computers and cognition, as well as the development of e the emergent behavior of parallel processing computers distinct from top-down control characterizing mainframe computers and Rodney Brooks's bottom-up architecture of insect robot robots capable of learning in real time exemplify these possibilities. One grand narrative that requires further conceptualization, however, is that from embodiment to disembodied, uh, uh, from embodiment to disembodiment, an onto theological narrative characterized by hatred for the body, by which the conversion of machinery to replace human labor or even human desire, uh, or he, human desire, and here I would point to Duchamp's hilarious bachelor apparatus separated from the bride like a steam engine from cold and hot um, uh, gas um, uh, uh, serves in an illustration. The recent attention paid to the concept of the singularity as a disconnection thesis might therefore be understood as a kind of Greco-Christian wet dream. Uh, here I'm mixing my metaphors, of course, but um, it's a throwaway line. This, talks, this talk creates a context for these two grand narratives by demonstrating how central they were to the avant-garde strain of high modernism in the works and writings of Henri Robert Marcel Duchamp. We can locate Duchamp's sources for these narratives in the mathematics of Henri, Berks, uh, Henri Poincaré and the philosophy of Henri Bergson, both of whom he read carefully. These competing paradigms also seem to play a role in the shift from a disembodied computational deterministic model of cognition, exemplified by the work of polymath John von Neumann, to a contingently emergent model of embodied and inactive cognition, exemplified by the work of Francisco and others, who look back to Maurice Pont, uh, Merleau-Ponty as a godfather, who in turn owes much to Henri Bergson and Enmer Husserl, sometime, uh, not often, uh, something not often acknowledged by a phenomenology dominated by Heidegger's being dominating time. I will frame how Bergson's work Creative Evolution from 1907 informs Poincaré's essay on mathematical discovery from 1908, which in turn proves central to Duchamp's pre-World War I writings in green box notes to large glass, roughly 1912 to 1917, that eventually inform his posthumous masterwork being given one, the waterfall, two, the illuminating gas. Originally uh, in French, it's étant donné, which uh, is usually translated given, but actually I'm suggesting we need to literalize that to being given. I will conclude by addressing how Duchamp defines art as a creative act, an event generated by a charge field between object and onlooker, as he says, uh, involving the distinct cognitive processes of, quote, delay and exposure, and how Duchamp's chess treatise on the endgame, Opposition and Sister Squares Reconciled from 1932, can be read as an allegory of emergent distributed aesthetic cognition as an augury of imminence, whether mediated by, mediated by technology or no, and thus hinting at a narrative evolving from duality to univocality. So now Duchamp in light of the emergence revolution of the 1960s. Marcel Duchamp's work, Etant Donne, foregrounds the revolution of emergence, um, which took hold in science, philosophy, and the arts in the 1960s. We should remember within a relatively short period from uh, 1960 to 1970, Ilya Prigogine and Henri Otlan were publishing their research on non-equilibrium thermodynamics as several approaches to self-organizing systems beginning to take shape in physics. The work in second order, second order cybernetics by von Forster or Gordon Pask, Gregory Peetson, Umberto Maturana, Ludwig uh, Bertin-Laffy and others helped stake out a general systems theory postulating in part an analogous relationship between the negentropy of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, 
a term from, uh, now I'm blanking on his name. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't think, but uh, uh, for, uh, from a work uh, on what is life from 1943, postulating um, and, and communication systems, um, 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 uh, exemplified it by Shannon and Wiener. This uh, led eventually to a major shift in the paradigm of computation as well as transforming our understanding of social systems. Maturana and Barella were beginning to think through their theory of autopoiesis and uh, cognition based on Maturana's earlier work in neurobiology, applying the models of self-referentiality specific to cybernetics, uh, uh, cybernetic models to the behavior of biological systems. Jazz performers were expanding, uh, experimenting with polytonal polyrhythmic polyphony as an, an emergent embodied and distributed process without a top-down central compositional roadmap. Gilles Deleuze publishes Difference and Repetition, uh, uh, which explores the cognitive, conceptual, and social significances of the distinction between differentiation and differentiation corresponding re respectively to the being of reversible duration and the becoming of irreversible duration linked initially to classical and quantum and uh, 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 quantum dynamics on the one hand and equi equilibrium and non-equilibrium thermodynamics on the other as models of the world. Also, Spencer Brown develops the laws of form, a form of boundary map that proves central to the works of uh, Heinz von Forster, Gregory Bateson, Umberto Maturano, and Francisco Varela. This is the context for Duchamp revealing posthumously a work of art called Eton Donne, whose English translation means literally being given one, the waterfall, two, with the illuminating gas. I would like to examine Duchamp's masterwork because it speaks to how Marcel Duchamp's own theory of creativity incorporates the observer's reception of an artist's work in a, the famous passage from, from the creative work, um, the creative act, excuse me. Perhaps it is only when spectators called art historians fully comprehend just how intimately great art interrogates the science and strange attractor of state, uh, the strange attractor state of fame, obscurity, and rehabilitation justly stabilizes. As we will see for Duchamp, art and its reception becomes defined as an emergent distributed cognitive event propagating through time. Eton Dene, being, being given one the waterfall, uh, the, uh, the illuminating gas, sorry. When the assemblage Etant Donne appeared in, Duchamp, in the Duchamp collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art after Duchamp's death in 1968, it seemed to violate many of the conceptual postures adopted by Duchamp over a, li a lifetime, including that of meta-irony. One walks to the right rear of the room holding the Duchamp, uh, uh, which holds the Duchamp collection and enters a darkened doorway that funnels art patrons to the left towards a medieval door through which ambient light streams through chinks in the door. One walks up to a chink in the door at eye level and peers at a perplexing yet scandalous scene, uh, scandalous scene with two main objects vying for the attention of the viewer. One, a fake backlighted waterfall. Two, a lit glass lamp held by the outstretched hand of a three, partially dismembered torso of a woman made of, 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 of a frame and pigskin, whose splayed legs reveal the entrance to the womb. And finally, four, the subject position of the art patron now confronting the condition of self-consciousness and stumbling into an act of voyeurism that violates cultural mores. Notice the incorporation of the cognition of the subject into the object art in, in a way very different from the famous work Las Meninas by Velasquez. Over 20 years in the making, while Duchamp pretended to be retired, just an idle breather, as he says, but revealed only posthumously, Etan Donne has as its physical foundation an altered chessboard, uh, 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 an altered chessboard floor with intersecting geometries implying n dimensions represented in a two-dimensional field. 
Upon this being given to literalize Eton Dunne, Duchamp carefully constructed a tableau composed of a landscape, geological features, objects, and an ambiguous partial female figure that comprises a series of four icons of processes of becoming associated with a new paradigm of emergence or self-organization, irreversibility, complexity, morphogenesis, and self-referentiality. Now, Given Duchamp's notorious reputation as a meta-ironical debunker of both affirmation and denial, it is startling when one recognizes the four fundamental concepts of emergence onto the scene. The irreversible nature of the flow of the waterfall, the complex thermodynamic processes at work enabling the illumination of the gas lamp, the womb in which the site of gestation and thus morphogenesis, and for the interior feedback looping exemplified by the alternating titillation and, and re, uh, revulsion ex generated by the conflicted self-conscious art patron. Irreversible time, complex entropic processes, bifurcation individual at the level, at the level of cells and organs, and systematic, uh, systemic self-referentiality, which unite around an intimate connection between creativity and life. All are highlighted by the scientists and philosophers exemplifying Duchamp's epoch. Yet a problem emerges with a simplistic reading of the icon iconography of this work. If one is to believe the chronology presented by Michel Senouet, salt cellar collection of Duchamp's writings, these particular references from the green box notes for large glass, where Duchamp lays out the principles for Etan Dene, seem to date to before World War II, or at least during its initial stages before he left uh, for New York City. And here I'm gonna read uh, the passage. Given one, uh, first the waterfall to the illuminating glass, we shall determine the conditions for the instantaneous state of rest or, a or allegorical appearance of a succession of a group of various facts seeming to necessitate each other under certain laws in order to isolate the sign of the accordance between the state of rest capable of all innumerable eccentricities and on the other, a choice of possibilities authorized by these laws and also determining them. For the state of instantaneous rest, bring in the term extra rapid. We shall determine the conditions of the best expose of the extra rapid state of rest, of the extra rapid exposure, allegorical appearance of a group, et cetera. Nothing, perhaps. When we see the terms being given and then one, the waterfall to the illuminating gas, rest or exposure and innumerable eccentricities and then delay and choice of possibilities, the reference to laws as both authorizing the choice of possibilities and also determining those laws, we get the felt meaning that Duchamp seems to present a logic that might govern both physical processes and processes of thought. This concern, this conceit in turn becomes reinforced when Duchamp references these processes which are associated with illuminating gas and occur in the dark in terms reminiscent of both entropy and human cognition and ideation. We are now a long way from the repetitive reversible movements of the bachelors as desiring machines in large glass, definitively unfinished in 1923, the laws of which mass, uh, match precisely the logic and behavior, uh, and behavior of the machinery of law and its complicit nation, nation states as Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari demonstrate so eloquently. Now perhaps this sounds far-fetched, a juvenile reading guided more by enthusiasm than by sophisticated art historical practice, not to mention rigorous philosophical practice, but compare this passage from Duchamp's green, ba uh, green box notes to large glass with a passage from the mathematician Henri Poincaré on the nature of scientific creativity, his essay on mathematical discovery, which I had uh, highly recommended that you read for this, uh, this but uh, if you haven't, uh, please do read it because it's just an amazing document. The context for this essay is that Poincaré seeks to describe the processes by which he was able to make one of the most important discoveries in modern mathematics. 
the synthesis of the n-dimensional manifolds of Riemann with ensemble theory, which eventually become deployed to model virtual timelines in phase space. So the n-dimensions of Riemann and the probable uh, istic uh, algebra of ensemble theory. Uh, and, uh, and so here is uh, uh, the passage from Poincaré. Poincaré describes illumination as a eureka moment that destables the order of both things and models. Thoughts are like, as he says, Democritus's atoms attached to walls and then, quote, during a period of apparent repose, but of unconscious work, some of the atoms are detached from the wall and set in motion. They plow through space in all directions like the gaseous molecules in the kinetic theory of gases. Their mutual collisions may, then may produce new combinations. Then he go on, uh, goes on to say, my comparison is very crude, but I cannot well see how I could explain my thought in any other way. Polemically, this is Duchamp's illuminating gas. Here we find the first speculation in the scientific literature of thermodynamic processes of gas capable of emergence or self-organization, that one portal that uh, Boltzmann had suggested, as well as the first precise analogy between emergent behavior in physics and chemistry and cognitive processes, a tropical correspondence between physical law and cognitive behaviors associated with mathematical and artistic creativity, and for Duchamp, uh, for, uh, uh, for Poincaré, mathematical creativity, for Duchamp, artistic creativity. Poincaré's famous model of creativity from this essay, adopted by behavioral psychologists as well as art theorists involving preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification, is dominated by one central tropical conceit. The thoughts are like Democritus's atoms attached to walls, and at moments of transformative insight, not only those atoms, but also the walls to which they are attached, can in a process reminiscent of, Brown, uh, reminiscent of Brownian motion, but not limited to that, and only uncharacteristically um, uh, 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 given uh, the context of end game thermodynamics, becomes capable of what Simondon, uh, uh, what Gil Gilbert Simondon might term transduction. It might spontaneously disassemble and reassemble in novel and unpredictable ways and produce completely new re regimes of thought, transformation of the factitious of both things and models, as Stengers would say. What makes this passage significant, aside from the detailed echoes that we find in Duchamp's own contemplation of artistic creativity, is that Ilya Prigogine in Physics and Chemistry and Francisco Varela in Neurobiology and Cognitive Science have cited this passage by Poincaré as an urtext for emergence. Not only is it the first passage in scientific literature speculating on the, on the pat on the behavior of entropic processes capable of self-organization in contrast to the end game of thermodynamic equilibrium, but it's also the precise analogy in the scientific literature, the first science, the precise analogy in the scientific literature between emergent behavior in physics and chemistry. And at this particular moment is still both theoretically and empirically non-existent and emergent cognitive processes. This passage from Poincaré anticipates the emergence, of revolu uh, emergence revolution of the 1960s. It also presages the analogies between self-organizing processes in thermodynamics and emergent cognitive processes, which informed the work of scientists like Francisco Varela, who in 1981 coined the expression, quote, Brownian science, to describe the need for a new kind of mathematics required to model the complexity of emergent cognitive processes, for which he gravitated first to phase space and then to Spencer Brown's The Laws of Form. Furthermore, the synthesis of two branches of mathematics Poincaré refers to in On Mathematical Discovery leads directly to the work by Gibbs and Einstein to event and then to apply the end dimensions of phase space, di uh, phase space diagrams to model complex processes found initially in the field of equilibrium thermodynamics and then central to an understanding of emergent processes in physics, such as bifurcation. And that would be Prigogine and Atlan and others in the context of non-equilibrium thermodynamics and emergent neuronal synchrony uh, and, and 
and, dis and desynchrony in cognitive science as in Varela, Petito, and others. Shea's space helped Varela model the Brownian science of cognition he sought as, for example, his deployment to illustrate the cascade effect of grand mal seizures. But, but the student was also able to teach the teacher. So let us examine where Poincaré found inspiration in Henri Bergson's theory of durée, memoir, and élan vital, which many of you may be familiar. Okay, so now Bergson. Born in Paris to British and Polish Hasidic Jewish parents, Henri Bergson was an exceptional student demonstrating precocious mastery of biology, psychology, philosophy, and mathematics, especially mathematics. Bergson won the, national, the French National Prize in Mathematics in 19, 1877 while still a lycée student, which brought him into prominence and led to a meeting and then a lifelong relationship with the great mathematician Henri Poincaré, the eventual PD, uh, PhD supervisor of Prigogine's dissertation director, de Donder. Uh, at the Free University of Brussels. Bergson earned his PhD in, in 1888. He wrote his major and minor, minor doctoral theses. The first uh, set asserts a primacy of irreversible time in uh, uh, time and free will, essay sur les données in immediate uh, de la conscience. Uh, pardon my French, please. Uh, the second thesis in Latin, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm even, I, I can't even order, um, uh, uh, meals in a restaurant in Latin. Um, uh, so I'll just say Aristotle's conception of place is a historical critique of the spatialization of time. In an ironic twist, Heidegger cites the second thesis in Being and Time, using it to justify his claim that Bergson's view of time remains within the horizon of Greek and, Plat and therefore Platonic metaphysics, while appropriating many of Bergson's post-Kantian insights into the nature of duration for his own. And this is perhaps the classic example of a three-card Monty citation. Bergson's publishing career began with a book on Lucretius, uh, who, if you um, are aware, um, uh, followed Democritus and developed a theory of the swerve. And then in a series of books critiquing the philosophical and psychological distinction between time and duration in, in Herbert Spencer and Immanuel Kant in Time and Free Will, uh, which was his uh, original dissertation, and then extending from philosophy and psychology to scientific inquiry and biology by critiquing the mechanical and teleological interpretations of Darwin's mechanic, mechanistic and Lamarck's teleolog teleological theories of evolution in matter and memory. In Creative Evolution, published the year before Science and Method, Bergson formulates a cosmic theory of emergence that applies to both the natural world and to human thinking and institutions with reference to 19th century speculations about a biology of knowledge. While continuing to make visible and challenge uh, the so-called natural assumptions of spatializing time, uh, underlying clocks and calculus that structure the psychological, social, economic, and political order of the, social, of the industrial revolution. In Two Sources of Morality and Religion, Bergson extends this theory of creative evolution, uh, evolution into analysis of the relationship between religion and culture by contrasting the orthodox and defensive nature of closed systems and the heterodox and mystical nature of open systems, reminding everyone that systems theory speculating on, on the relationship between uh, 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 open and closed systems really doesn't uh, 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 come into mainstream thought until the 1960s. But underlining the systematic building of an emergent view of creative intelligence involving Durain, Memoir, and, and Elan Vital, from physiochemical systems to biology, and then from biology to realms of human intelligence and social organization, lies a, petite, uh, a pointed critique of the assumption that time is merely an abstract function spatialized in geometry, which obscures the embodied reality of lived duration. For Bergson, there are psychological and social costs to this disembodiment of human cognition from lived duration by superimposing spatialized time onto it. Recent research by Warren Diedrich, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, and others on the origins and consequences of what they call cognitive capitalized capitalism has emphasized how contemporary global and economic and communications networks, both social and digital, suppress an individual's, uh, individual's cognitive bifurcation. 
And that's the term that they use, a top-down suppression from the noological, which is from Lazzarato, to the neurological, which is from Nedic. That, one, that, uh, that is one consequence of these networks. With the emergent behavior, a cognitive bifurcation associated with creativity and freedom of thought writ large. And here I would just mention, uh, it's the only time I'll mention jazz, is I have an essay on, um, uh, on bifurcation and cognitive capitalism and phase space with respect to jazz improvisation uh, called The Gift of Silence, which you can find on my, on my website. But Bergson got there first. We find one origin for just such a critique of cognition altered by the Industrial Revolution by his insistence of a direct link between the hegemony of reversible nature of spatialized time associated with clock time and calculus over engineering economic and social and political systems, as well as cognition through clock time and calculus and the assumptions behind that, uh, that grounding uh, in the descriptions of the human of uh, the descriptions of human cognition by Immanuel Kant, which was shaped by Luton, uh, Newton and Leibniz, Bergson says, like ordinary knowledge, science is concerned only with aspects of repetition. Anything that is irreducible and irreversible in the successive moments of a history eludes science. Here we note his attempt to expand the purview of science and philosophy as they were currently constituted. But to succeed in that expansion, Bergson finds that he must, quote, do violence to the mind to go counter to the bent of the intellect. But that is just the function of philosophy, he says. Rather than demonstrate hostility to science, Bergson seeks to make visible what has happened to human thought and social organization since the Industrial Revolution with its pervasive social and cognitive organization by means of machinery. In other words, Bergson addressed how the epistemic implications of the spatialization of time codified by Newton and Leibniz in mathematics and science and then modeled in the cognitive manifold by Kant and philosophy have implanted themselves as well through social structures onto embodied cognition by means of the industrial revolution and the organization of institutions according to the logic of heat engines. There have been costs from this superimposition. Bergson believes that these systems have become so pervasive that human psychology have lost the capacity for, intu for intuition and creativity, except in fits and starts. In the face of such a limited model of the world, the conclusion that there's a correspondence between the laws of geometry by which time has function only, and those governing the world of nature and human cognition seems inescapable, quote, all the operations of our intellect tend to geometry as to the goal where they find their perfect fulfillment. But as geometry is necessary, necessarily prior to them, it is evident that it is a latent geometry imminent with our idea of space, which is the main spring of our intellect and the cause of its working. In the discovery of time, Stephen Toulmin reminds us, as Vico insisted, the mathematical systems springs from the fact that they are our own creations. We know them fully because we ourselves have made them. We can remind ourselves here as well that some 68 years after Vico, the romantic poet William Blake said in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell about 1793, the same thing about our gods and our theologies. This is what Stengers means by reciprocal capture. Why he, while she coins the term cosmopolitics to describe the epistemological struggle which Duchamp's cor corpus illustrates and which we can now acknowledge extends into ontotheology. Bergson uses the term imminence here ironically. Imminence is not natural, but the time-space geometry of calculus superimposed upon human cognition by the assumption of a mechanical deterministic worldview, which then constrains through habit the reach of human cognition and the expression of its creativity. Bergson underscores the need to, quote, break with scientific habits which are adapted to the fundamental requirements of thought, unquote. So Bergson argues that not only is the reversible model of time of his contemporary science incapable of addressing the processes of living systems, it, is, it also becomes incapable at the level of cognition of enabling the very creative processes of invention from which new forms of thought might emerge, including the kind, a kind of science that can address living systems. Furthermore, it cannot make its own ontological assumptions visible to itself. itself. He challenges these assumptions in a way that builds on the critique of Kant by Solomon Maimon that objects of intuition, things and ideas are not 
are not only created in the mind, but the spatial temporal order structuring those relationships among those objects through induction and dejection is created there as well. In other words, the factitious of things and models. Maimon's achievement anticipates the critique of geometry as not natural, but socially constructed. By Henri Poincaré in mathematics in his famous essay on the origins of geometry from 1899, as well as by Bergson in his secondary thesis uh, on space critiquing Aristotle and Husserl, who also wrote a book on the origins of, of geometry. It places into perspective the mathematician Leopold Kronecker's attempt to create a generative model for mathematics as a, character, as a category of cognitive objects within the manifold distinct from things and ideas, a whole new system based on a true origin of ge geometry. Excuse me, let me take a drink. Here we find a form of calculus without zero, without negative or irrational numbers, without the timeless truths of geometry. It is a mathematics built from the role of reversible, irreversible time in cognition. What is crucial for Kronika is the spontaneous difference that emerges through time between the appearance of two after the appearance of one the emergence of their relation, the phenomenology of unfolding integers. This might surprise some, it might surprise some that one of the founders of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, a mentor for the later intuitive mathematician Brouwer, studied mathematics for, with Leo, Leopold Kronecker. From duality to uni, univocality, Duchamp, chess, and distributed cognition. At this point, we should remember that chess captures the reversible perspective being by building into its ritual, the timeless contemplation of possible alternative futures into its ritual, as opposed to the spontaneous processing of those futures in jazz improvisation, for example. It's one of the reasons for my research in jazz is, is this particular point. To the point, chess has served as a metaphor and by extension as a model for the reversible laws of physics exemplified by calculus, most pointedly by Richard Feynman, and as I demonstrated to illustrate the time symmetry of quantum electrodynamics, but also as a metaphor and model for top-down computational cognition by John von Neumann, Claude Shannon, and Alan Turing, with the first two writing influential essays on chess as a paradigm for computation and Turing for actually writing a program for a chess playing computer before that computer even uh, uh, was, uh, had an existence. This first distinction between time reversible and time irreversible perspectives as foregrounded by the chess metaphor finds its way into linguistics in the naive synchronic diachronic model of de Saussure and in the ironic historically contingent model of Wittgenstein. We can now see a emerging a bifurcation in the use of chess as a theory constitutive metaphor distinguishing in its naive, uh, naive appropriation that buys into the epistemol and buys into the epistemological baggage from its ironic appropriation in its subversion of this very baggage. From metaphor to model, we now address allegory of chess as integrating two grand narratives. Chess also becomes deployed to narrate cosmic processes that come to apply through a parallelism with both physical laws and human civilization through the application of local symmetries onto an asymmetrical uh, uh, chessboard. And you can see uh, that these zones, are, are, um, uh, and I'll explain that in a, uh, in a second. Um, the game plays out through a principle of attrition warfare, the larger forces governing both internal combustion engines and the social orders undergoing reorganization to maximize its economic potential. Their reversible laws of physics are applied to control the thermodynamic processes of heat in order to produce work. From Carnot and Clausius to Lord Kelvin uh, to Clark Maxwell, the twofold decline in efficiency found in heat engines applied from first to the universe in its entirety towards thermodynamic decline. 
For the second, by analogy applied to human civilization, an allegory picked up by the American Henry Adams and the German Oswald Spengler and applied to human history, as in the decline of the West. Marcel Duchamp reached master status in interna international play. He wasn't just a, a chess he, a chess player. He was a, he was a grandmaster. So Marcel Duchamp reached master status in international play and co-authored with Vitaly Haberstadt a work on opposition theory and the end game. Opposition et les cases conjugués sont réconciliation. Opposition and sister Correa's reconcile from 1932. That year, Duchamp also played for the Paris City Championship against Francois de Lillianne, a mathematician, game theorist, and future founder of the Olipo movement of avant-garde poetry and fiction, and, and strongly uh, influenced by second order cybernetics. Duchamp won the Paris tournament in 1933, and then translated Nosko Porovsky's masterpiece, uh, masterpiece on opening moves, How to Play Chess Openings. Duchamp also played chess with Samuel Beckett on and off for nine years while living in Paris between world wars. Beckett wrote Endgame in which the formal oppositional relationship between the characters can be analyzed using Duchamp's chess treatise. Duchamp also taught John Cage how to play chess when they lived together in New York City. Well, they didn't live together, but they lived in New York City in the 1950s. At, jazz, at, at Cage's compositional chess event in 1968, which occurred before Duchamp's death, Tini Duchamp was one of the players uh, alongside uh, Marcel and, and uh, who replaced Marcel and then finished the game for him. And that was modeled on a chess game. Nabokov in turn taught, uh, uh, Nabokov, uh, 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 excuse me, I skipped a line. Duchamp also ch uh, played chess with uh, Vladimir Nabokov who wrote a novel called The Defense modeled on a chess game. Nabokov in turn uh, taught literature and creative writing to Thomas Pynchon, whose novel Gravity's Rainbow has numerous references to chess as hinted earlier and which appears in the character Marcel, the robot chess player. Of all the figures discussed, it is Duchamp that penetrated furthest into the epistemological baggage of chess as metaphor, model, and allegory. Yet despite criticisms from Robert Smithson and Thomas Pynchon of Duchamp as a 19th century anachronism with respect to chess and scientific epistemology, there's plenty of evidence that not only was Duchamp in, uh, deploying chess as a theory constitutive metaphor ironically, but also engaged in setting up the metaphor of chess as a portal to new metaphorical baggage and new scientific paradigms. Take, for example, Duchamp's humorous self-deprecating portrait as an everyman figure of disembodied cognition. For Duchamp, art should not be merely rental as with impressionistic painting, but should harken back to medieval uses as it looks towards modernity. Art, quote, in the service of the mind refers to its ability to engage with the science and philosophy of the age. So for Duchamp, the game of chess not only becomes a work of art unfolding through time, played out within the shared cognitive field of competing players, it also becomes a commentary on the limits of chess as a metaphor model and allegory of human cognition. For Duchamp, chess represents a limited model of cognition, a limitation that one ignores at one's peril. In Duchamp's chess treatise, the term opposition associated with a standoff between kings has a synonym in the term equilibrium. And this term has roots in both the game theorizing of von Neumann as discussed by Anna Longo, as well as equilibrium thermodynamics referring specifically to the end game of systems death for a thermodynamic system. The aim of the chess treatise is to reestablish equilibrium between the kings in their opposition after any move which involves the complex form of folding and then inverting the sections of the chessboard so that the kings seem to emerge out of the same square, opposition and sister squares reconciled. So given the asymmetry of the chessboard, 64 squares, eight squares on a side, the chess player manipulates a small symmetrical section of the board surrounding a king so that it is enfolded and then, and so it is folded and then inverted so that the king falls on top of the other king. This superimposes a temporary symmetry onto the asymmetrical chessboard, but this super, uh, superimposition must be redone by each king after each move. 
one cannot win using this overdetermined ritual. One can only avoid defeat. The folding and inverting of the chessboard alludes to Riemann's n-dimensional geometry while also underscoring that this invol involution of ge geometrical space can only occur outside of time's flow. Humans create timelessness and only human beings. Kronecker, Poincaré, and Brouwer point out that geometries are socially constructed and all of Western math mathematics, save for integers and the imminent continuum, are, are about power and control over the, wor over the world. Excuse me, I get the hiccups. In this sense, time is suspended between moves, and in this ritual timeless realm, the powers of memory that chess pairs use to map the possible futures is astounding. And in on mathematical discovery, Poincaré argues uh, it's actually superior to mathematicians. He actually talks about it in, in, this, in this essay. Resonating with the distinction in Duchampian aesthetics between delay and exposure, the end of the, of the end game occurs in a flash, in a breach of opposition, when the contingency of a mistake by one of the players intrudes upon the timeless geometry of opposition, so that delay implied by the perpetual geometry of equilibrium becomes ruptured by the emergence of exposure as the breach of opposition precipitating the end of the end game. Here we find the beginnings of Duchamp's transformation of chess from what Richard Boyd uh, in Metaphor and Thought calls a, constitute, a theory constituted metaphor carrying epistemological baggage into a portal in new realms, in, uh, into new realms implying new epistemologies and new paradigms. For Duchamp, that portal is etat donne. From duality to univocality, art is distributed cognition. For Duchamp, the spectator brings the work of art in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his contribution to the creative act." Unquote. Duchamp joins the artist, the work of art, and the spectator onto a common field as an event, as an interference pattern of creative, creation and interpretation, mediated, uh, mediated by the chess pieces as artifacts, and resembling the seemingly symmetrical vectors created through time upon the 64 squares of a chessboard, which Duchamp calls Eros's matrix. For Duchamp, the mapping of subject position merely externalizes the mirror interiority of subject formations within the artist and within the observer. Paraline, uh, paraline, uh, uh, per, uh, paralleling the insights of Poincaré and Bergson concerning the social origins of geometry as a symptom of control, Duchamp insists that the mind in inevitably moves towards the condition of geometry. It is the infinite regression of mind's will to geometry that constitutes its pathology. This diagnosis, as well as the hope for mind's liberation from a relentless geometricality, becomes the focus for all Duchamp's work from New Descending a Staircase from 1912, which spoofs both the end dimensionality of cubism, as well as the accelerated trajectories mapped by calculus exemplifying the aesthetics of futurism. We have mentioned briefly how opposition and like cases conjugate so reconcilié, opposition and sister squares reconciled, delineates the rules governing the avoidance patterns of the two kings seeking opposition or equilibrium, so that what goes on in the minds of the players is more important than what's actually on the board. Breach of opposition refers to the disruption of that regal equilibrium, a moment of positional disadvantage due to a miscalculation that precipitates the end of the end game, a moment that both kings avoid at all costs. Duchamp's chess treatise can thus be read as a rhetoric of the aporia, so that breach of opposition corresponds to the charged moment that Duchamp calls in the green box to large glass exposure. The aporia serves as a portal which triggers mirror inter interiority within the mind of the observer. It pivots the destabilized dimensions of verbal and visual structures, a chaotic vortex triggered by the avant-garde event, which, Duchamp, which Deleuze would call a shock to thought, uh, to thought as a fundamental encounter, and what Poincaré calls a moment of illumination. 
This force field, which Duchamp calls delay, and which he judges to be both intoxicating and habit forming, resembles the vectors created through time upon the 64 squares of the chessboard. A game between artist and onlooker, or a drug, as I said before. Duchamp describes the laws governing this field of force with pataphysical pseudo-mathematical precision. And they help to conceptualize the charge moment of exposure, which ends the end game of art in the terrorizing avant-garde event. Occurring as an infinite regression of mirror interiorities, this event short circuits the force field formed by the complicity between artist and observer. A more refined sense of Duchamp's concept of delay comes from his preface to Green Box Notes, which we've already seen, in which he juxtaposes delay with the concept of exposure. Prefaced by what would become the title of Eton Donnet, this passage um, dissolves one opposition, that of art and interpretation, and creates another. On the one hand, we have the instantaneous state of rest or allegorical appearance, which is, quote, capable of all the innumerable eccentricities, unquote, indicating a liberating moment from undetermined cognitive flows experienced as pure contingency. On the other hand, we have terms of succession, various facts, choice of possibilities, which collectively indicate a superimposition of spatial and temporal difference upon cognitive processes, responding to the world habitually by experiencing the flow of duration as a series of still frames, mathematically through calculus, conceptually through schematic forms, musically through staves, bars, and time signatures, or artistically through a single lens reflex or motion picture camera. The pun on exposure and expose signifies a momentary and surreptitious flash and a scandalous revealing in the journalistic sense, evoking the subject position of the art patron reviewing the etantane, viewing etantane. It thus provides within itself the difference between the moment of exposure to the pure apprehension of duration stripped of regimes of reciprocal capture and the conceptualizing of the moment, which also serves to defer the moment in the process of conceptualizing while titillating our interest as voyeurs in it as well. Furthermore, the passage addresses equivocally what may be the essence or function of the accordance between of exposure itself as a potentially infinite mirror interiority. Is it an allegorical appearance? The bride basically is a motor, but before the mo being a motor, which transmits her timid power, she is this very timid power. And here, I don't have to, I, I had to eliminate this part, but I go into a whole thing on cross uh, dressing and the photograph uh, 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 by Man Ray of uh, Marcel Duchamp and drag. <coughs> In other words, is exposure made possible by a double invagination simply uh, a hieroglyph that could be called a transcendental signifier, a sign of the accordance between, or is it nothing perhaps, or a reminder of being's fiction by demonstrating its crystalline impossibility in the contingent world of irreversible duration? Or is it perhaps, or perhaps it represents the end of the tyranny of being as the necessary premise for all geometric constructs in the pure contingency of becoming, liberated by the disruption of the mechanisms of signification, which constitutes the terror of the avant-garde event. And here I might mention uh, Arakawa and Gin's famous work before their architecture called the mechanism of, of, of meaning. All this toying of, uh, with opposition suggests an infinite regression, a mirror interiority exemplified by the capacity of reversible properties of calculus, to spatialize time into an infinite number of points on a trajectory or by the capacity of n-dimensional geometry to generate an infinite regression of interior spatiality outside of time in much the same way. Quote, the pendu femelle, uh, Duchamp and Drag, is the form in ordinary perspective of a pendu femelle for which one could perhaps try to discover the true form. This comes from the fact that any form is the perspective of another form according to a, ver a certain vanishing point and a certain distance. Thus, we find cognitive correlate in the way that Duchamp represents the mind constructing thinking spaces as a series of involuted frames 
potentially an infinite regression in order to stave off the doom of the subject's dismantling in order to delay exposure. In a permutation on the given passage that immediately follows, Duchamp adds, given if given in the dark, repeating in the dark close to a reference for the illuminating gas or clouds of signification surrounding the artifact at the moment of exposure, here he seems to insist on the interior and contingent nature of the condition of exposure in its relation to the relationship to the succession or the cognitive tactics of delay. It must take place within the individual mind in solitude. But while, while the concept we has in, uh, in, in effect has no being except as an arbitrary subcategory within delay itself, yet Paradoxically, the we can only manifest in terms of embodied and distributed consciousnesses. The dispersed plenitude of the I between the art and the fact reverberates in a sophisticated way with complex systems, the implications of which were anticipated by Poincaré and Berst. So let me end that and end there and um, uh, 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 let you all uh, give a big sigh of relief uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, maybe take a break and I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, begin a discussion. Now, how do I shut this off? Ah, there we go. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, so you you would like to take a break? Um, no, I can go on. Oh, okay. So so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions because it's like an informal session and we're not gonna have like that kind of moderating type of job. So yeah, please go ahead. Also, I'm inviting the attendees to join the session. And um, yeah, please, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, in the questions? Uh, there's nothing in the question and answer. Um, would it Hello. be in the, in the chat? Oh, can, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Okay, hi. Th thank you, Martin. It was a, a absolutely delicious uh, presentation, extremely stimulating. Um, um, would you have uh, something to say about ethics of creation? Let's say we um, we presuppose this this um, permutating chess game in time and this um, absolutely uh, radical freedom to uh, undergo transformation with the the, uh, the the proposal um, at the start of the presentation in the irreversible irre 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 time of um, creativity deployment, would you have uh, something like a, a netos or netex to to work with this kind of pure chaos <laughs> of uh, of deployment? Um, actually, I, in the essay. Um, uh, that I suggested as background reading um, uh, for this talk uh, called Portals in Duchamp and Pynchon. Um, I actually coined uh, the term uh, ethics of cognition. Uh, and actually that got picked up and there was a whole um, uh, uh, art show uh, built around uh, that concept um, uh, a, a number of years later, I think it was 97. Uh, so this is something I'm very much invested in and it's one of the reasons uh, why I started working on on uh, the theories and the architecture of Arakawa and Gins, uh, as well as jazz. Um, and I address uh, the ethics of this in an essay called The Gift of Silence, which you can find on my website. Uh, 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 so, um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I could go. Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, please. I'm, I'm, I'm used to thinking about this in terms of jazz, uh, um, but it's it's such a huge topic that uh, without uh, 
prefacing uh, that with a talk almost as long as this one. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how I could get there from here, uh, uh, but um, uh, I'd be interested in hearing what you might say about that. Well, okay. Uh, well, because uh, uh, in my in my own little systems, I I, I I was extremely glad to hear everything you you said because I I felt that it, the intuition itself of the critique of the system I'm in in the art professional art system in, in French Canada um, and. I was starting to implement these kind of of um, re redirection of systems within the systems to to produce new structure parallel but competing, and so and so I'm starting to grow a, a bit conscious about ethics of um, chaos development and to to manage the destructuration of institutional public management and and. Um, and so I, 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 you mean like you mean like Trump only different? Uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I, I will, I would, I will, I would love to dream that um, there, there can be a, like a synesthetic emergence within competing systems, so they can mutually critique themselves and, and grow instead of destruct or actually manage their own decay in time. I, I it seems that. Uh, the knowledge of death is still not inherent to these systems, like the generational shift. And so, when the generation when a generation change, it does not so much produce any kind of um, uh, cyclic structure to change the artistic ethos. And so, I, I, if we have, if we got this kind of chess game going on, we could induce um, pre-programmation of the the. the the switching of the board plate of the, the the board game, and so and so, but but yes. like what what like Deleuze and Guattari talk about in their in their shift from from chess to go. Oh, may, it might be I haven't read that uh, that one, but I, I uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I, uh, early on I, I did a kind of Deridian reading of of these tropes in in, uh, in Freud and Deleuze, uh, and there I, I, um, uh, 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 the essay is dynamic and thermodynamic tropes of the subject in Freud and Deleuze, uh, and there I talk about the difference between chess and go, uh, and that was also in my dissertation. Uh, I, I think I think it's a very powerful, uh, uh, illuminating uh, 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 passage in in uh, in Deleuze. Okay, I'm noting. Thank you. Yes. Ada? Hi, yeah, so great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I did have a question about probability in science. That was really interesting because um, in terms of probability, you're um, analyzing data and you're making sense of that data in terms of the mean. Um, and you never get to the true population mean. So when we're talking about science and laws, um, are you trying to say that we're not really uh, moving towards a theory of truth, but instead just sort of um, trying to make sense of a set of data that we're given and accommodating or interpreting in that way? And um, then I have a follow-up question to that. Um, well, I'd say the first rather than the second. If you remember, I, I started off the talk with reference to um, uh, the beginning of this kind of imminent critique of scientific epistemology when Nietzsche says that truth is inertia. Uh, in other words, there is no probability with, with truth. So, um, uh, so uh, th that makes sense. It does actually make sense um, because Nietzsche actually talks a lot about logic and symbolic um, figures but that they need to be interpreted. And it's not that logic doesn't exist, but that it's actually funneled through some type of interpretation. And through that interpretation, we create systems, but they're not necessarily absolute as um, maybe someone trying to advocate for a Kantian point of view would do so. Um, but I did wanna ask you about um, duration emergence and uh, pataphysical philosophy. Um, so for example, in music, uh, the duration of sound can be uh, 
tweaked, right? You can be in four four time um, and in one bar, you can make, for example, the second note longer than the first to create um, a different type of interpretation in terms of the sound. Now, would that lead to a sort of emergence of of what a, a new type of interpretation that you're trying to convey? Here, here, um, uh, here's where music might really be helpful. Um, uh, I, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I uh, my dog will do the same. So <laughs> interrupt uh, and find their way into the conversation. Uh, in my first piece on jazz and cognition, which came out in 2010. Um, I talk about the calculus of music notation. Uh, and the fact is, is that modern musical notation emerges at the same time that calculus did. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Palestrina is one figure where these two very different regimes come together. Um, and Cage actually disrupts the system uh, uh, where he actually deploys phase space diagrams and uses them for orchestral scores. Hmm. Uh, completely changing the paradigm and blurring the boundary between music and noise. And by and implicitly, uh, implicitly arguing that music it is an emergent property caused simply by the, the shuffling of papers and, and the shifting of feet and, and, and coughing and, and, and so forth uh, during uh, four minutes and 22 seconds. Jazz, on the other hand, is very different in the sense in the sense that while Stravinsky, for example, <coughs> in L'Histoire du Soldat, um, uh, will um, uh, compose a piece of music where um, time signatures change every bar or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To what we find really beginning with bebop, which is that there are layers of rhythms existing simultaneously, which is what they call polyrhythms. And I argue that beginning with bebop, the properties, of, uh, uh, the principles of emergent properties seem to apply uh, because the principle of bifurcation can be shown even in music notation and made visible even in uh, uh, music notation with melody, with harmony, with harmonic rhythm, and with percussive rhythm. And I argue that it is jazz musicians more than anyone that have cultivated a science of cognitive bifurcation, that it's part of their training. And they learn to process music in real time as they exist in all these different dimensions, melody, harmony, har harmonic rhythm, and, and percussive rhythm, and are able to process bifurcations from the other players, as well as initiating them themselves. And they can do this beneath the threshold of conscious awareness. And, and they deliberately cultivate this. Well, so you see I, that too in JS Box music as well. Oh yes, yeah. I mean, I I was drawing stuff out of my hat. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, um, but when Bach composes, he's like a chess player. He exists outside of time, and then determines the possible futures for the system that he's constructing mm -hmm. from one moment to the next. That's why I call classical music music composed in the calculus of music notation. Got it, okay. Um, 
and I'm assuming that that is then consistent with Pata physical philosophy, correct? Well, Duchamp, Duchamp was really uh, involved in that, but what I was reading was his translating into pataphysics what I argue is already a war between competing paradigms, worldviews, really. Um, really, uh, he's portraying cosmopolitics in his art. Nice. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions. Hi, Martin. Um, great talk. Um, thank you. I, 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 I was just wondering if we could sort of zero back and I, I, I wanted to understand more about how this sort of um, irreversible time plays out in Etant Donné particularly. You, you talk about, interestingly, about the role of reflection, I think, or multiple reflections in, in that process. Maybe I misheard you, but I mean, it, it, I, I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm intrigued because, the, you know, obviously the title of the work um, makes a sort of, for me at least, makes a connection between the sort of idea of an epistemological given the idea of an encounter, there is some sense of it staging an encounter. Um, and yet, of course, the encounter, at least in, in, in um, the aesthetics of the encounters, we say find it in Deleuze, is not necessarily construable in terms of an epistemological given, say the, 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 the thesis, you know, criticizing Sellers, um, famous myth of the given. So I, I, I'm kind of wondering how that this, 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 this um, irreversible temporality and this um, encounter with something that is not, however, given as such as a kind of determinate yeah. thing kind of plays out in this, in this work. And I'm just wondering if I kind of understood that there's a role of reflection, but for example, in, in, in the kind of um, self-consciousness of one's own voyeurism, uh, confronting, you know, confronting the, the, the body and the, 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 you know, there's this, this sort of in a sense, pornographic um, aspect of the work that, that perhaps plays a role here. So, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you remember, Duchamp distinguishes between two kinds of hinges, which is also a reference to the chess treatise, one in the plane and the other in the mind. So in the plane of the work, the icons represent processes of emergence and represent the fundamental principles of emergence. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's the encounter, which is a shock to thought, to use Deleuze's mm. expression. And it's unstable. And in that instability, um, Theoretically, <laughs> that shock of titillation and embarrassment leads to a profound disruption and then reorganization as in a mo moment of illumination upon which art starts to be something different that 
by incorporating the cognitive processes of disruption of the uh, by incorporating the deliberate disruption of cognitive processes into the work of art itself you've really changed art from the Kantian object, whether beauty or sublime, to a distributed event mm. in, involving both the artist and the, and the observer. That's really that's really nice explained, uh, Martin. I appreciate that. I, I, it, and, it, and it kind of makes a nice it makes a, a clear connection between your your uh, uh, you know your account of the aesthetics of, the, of, the, of this visual work and and of course the 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 um the irreversible temporality of improvisation which is kind of you know i guess inherently irreversible um which again i guess you know, could be construed under say more as a as a as an encounter with something which can you know in a sense never be con consciously appropriated at least yeah you know, for the player yeah but notice notice the art patron has has no practicing before going up to the, yeah. the chink uh, and, and what I'm arguing is it's not just the symbolic logic of music. And yeah. the sounds that are associated that are being manipulated in the classroom, uh, in the, in the practice room, but mm -hmm. there's also the practice of experiencing, exp uh, 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 of bringing the mind to its simplest level so that exposure can happen. Right. 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 So there's yeah. Okay. So there's a sort of disanalogy there. Yeah. Here and, between. And, uh, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, so so that there's actually quite a strong disanalogy with, between the the position of the patron and the position of the musician, who will at least be, in a sense, uh, you know, kinesthetically prepared, prepared. You know, obviously, will have practiced their instrument. Will be, will yeah. you know, will have an understanding of the sort of harmonic and rhythmic space. Yeah. Now, for and, example, I've I've, I've um, theorized about passive distributed aesthetic cognition and active mm. distributed aesthetic cognition. Jazz being the example of active dis distributed aesthetic cognition. Okay, that's really passive, pa yeah. passive example. I have one from film and one from uh, the artist that uh, Stefan talked about, uh, Eduardo Katz. Mm. So, um, in in montage we what you have is the equivalent of distributed in the most primitive form of distributed computation that enabled by a mainframe computer so um given the the von neumann limit in uh, in a mainframe computer, which is only able to process one bit of information at a time, um, there's a form of um, parallel processing, which is actually uh, I'm trying to think of the name and it's blanking on my mind. This is where ageism is, uh, where where my uh, my cognition is. Uh, it's called, um, let me think of it. Uh, let me just describe it. Um, so in film, you have different points of view presented and then cut together multiple points of view and then arranged in a sequence where it goes back and forth but at 24 frames per second, the mind is only seeing mm. one frame at a time. So like with this primitive form of parallel processing by which you have multiple inputs from different uh, stations, 
all sending signals of information. And then the, and then the, the mainframe computer disassembles them on one side of the von Neumann bottleneck and then reassembles them into their separate lines. Is that, is that hyper-threading? I'm sort of remember, trying to remember my computing science here. Uh, um, and that's really what film is doing. Yeah. It's disassembling one into one frame at a time in the mind, and then the mind reassembles all the different points of view as if that mind were able to see the scene like the baby carriage falling, going down the stairs mm. in Battleship Potemkin, for example, from all points of view. Mm. And, and that's an example of passive uh, distributed aesthetic co uh, cognition. Another example would be uh, uh, Katz's uh, famous work, which he did in, in a show in Slovenia, which I talked about during Stefan's talk, where um, he put a seed in soil in a pot, watered the pot, and then put it in a completely darkened room over which he hung a bulb and a CUC me camera, and then attached the CUC me camera to the bulb, and then established a URL. And every time someone looked at that URL, oh, it was a strobe light, not a, not a, not a bulb, a strobe. The strobe would, would pop every time someone clicked on it. So it would be the attention of people all over the world as it happened, clicking on the URL that generated the strobe light in the darkened room, which then enabled photosynthesis to happen, making the seed and then the sprout and then the plant um, a, um, a, a parody of, um, of Coleridge's notion of uh, organic form. And, and that's another example of, of, of passive aesthetic cognition. And uh, uh, there are other circumstances, but what, what goes on with jazz is, as you know, as you know mm -hmm. personally, as you have embodied, is a very different animal. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really that's a really helpful distinction, Martin. Thank you. Um, um, so, in, 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 so, but there still seems to be a role for reflection in 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 the Duchamp because you know the, the very discomfort and sort of disorientation seems to. Seems seems premised on the viewer, or the, the the patron, in the sense suddenly become you know be being aware of their relationship to the to the artwork. In the sense that the the, yeah. the, 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 the the aesthetic relation itself becomes thematized, which I guess I think the, I think the collo the colloquial expression would be blowing the artist uh, the art patron's mind. And yeah. the way that the art patron's mind gets blown is by having that moment trigger cascades of mirror interiorities. Yeah, yeah. And dimensions. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I think that, that was the phrase I was sort of alluding to. And that, 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 that's, that's really, I mean, it's not necessarily reflection in, in, in a sort of classical sense where you, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, seem to apply a kind of much more in itself a, a, a more um, temporalized process which can never in a sense be recuperated yeah. and hence hence yeah. an encounter rather than a given which means that the models as well as the things are are, yeah. are being put into play yes so that that actually that's really nice so that integrates the the kind of metaphorics of the piece with the actual with the the, the, the phenomenal kind of, experience yeah yes. and the so body, both in the plane of the artwork and in the mind yeah lovely the, yeah and and duchamp had this all conceptualized yeah that's fantastic yeah i, I couldn't ask for a better answer martin it's fantastic incredibly um thought-provoking thank you uh, uh, so, uh, so now you're gonna let me off the hook <laughs> absolutely <laughs> well there's no hook i hope <laughs>
great question. Great question. No, thank you. That, that was really instructive and fantastic. So there's a, a from Ada. It's interesting that Poincaré was trying to move away from an analytic paradigm to move away from universal explanations, but tries to replace it with probability. And in trying to do so, he also universalizes uh, statistical probability in science and philosophy. Interesting contradiction. Yeah, I think I think that was right. I, I don't know how much he would have completely bought into that, but he certainly set the stages for other people to follow. But um, he was influenced by Kronecker. I mean, he partially bought into the, uh, the intuitionist project. And it was Brouwer that really uh, put it together. And Brouwer, as I mentioned, was a student of Husserl, who along with Bergson and, and Husserl cites Bergson as, as a major inspiration. Uh, for creating a model of cognition that had to begin with um, irreversible time. Yeah, I, I think my hand is the, is the one raised. I think you, well, thank you so much for this, this uh, conversation and your reflections. It's, really incredible. Um, I think you answer me uh, metaphorically, <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna ask anyways. Like, I think um, what you have been explaining, of course, applies to power dynamics and, um, and all the systems of, complex systems of beliefs, right? So I wonder if you entertain uh, in your reflections, how can this theory apply to promote the paradigm shift from dualistic to symbiotic, if it's possible or not? What do you think about between humans and non-humans entities? And I'm, I'm not referring only to machines, um, but, but other type of species too. Yeah, I don't know how. Um, I, I talk about this uh, with respect to jazz. Yeah. Because it has its influence on its audience um, and it celebrates cognitive bifurcation. And, and, um, and if you talk to people who, who love jazz, and perhaps you could extend it to all music, that it is a distributed phenomenon. Uh, uh, and I, I've always found interesting um, the ways in which um, musicians, particularly popular musicians, recognize the role of the audience in yeah. altering their cognitive processes yeah. through feedback loops. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so, and nor do I play one on TV, so. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know it's, it's a complicated subject, but I think I, I got, that's why I said that I, I got probably my answer from the metaphorical example. Um, thank you. Yeah, but you, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Martin, there are still a few questions in the chat above uh, other questions. Do you want to take a look at them? Um, oh, I think Martin already addressed it. Uh, he um, already sort of read out loud what I had put in the chat. Um, but I do have a question, Martin. Um, in terms of Husserl's, um, well, uh, better yet, uh, Nietzsche's uh, internal recurrence, uh, you had mentioned that a few times. I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more because a lot was said and I didn't necessarily capture uh, the importance of uh, Nietzsche's concept there. Well, it's, 
I'm really not an expert on Nietzsche. Um, and so um, I've been swayed by Deleuze's construction of that concept, that it's an eternal return to difference, not a re eternal re return to the same. So okay. it, it's really an expression of pure contingency that the okay. eternal return is. It's not an eternal return to the same, it's an eternal return to difference. Right. Okay, because I've never read to lose. Um, so, um, I haven't really thought about this in a long time. But from the whole notion that you can have one instant to the next, that's calculus, right? Yeah. That's infinitesimal calculus, the ability to divide time into an infinite number of um, of still points on a, on a line. But if, if you, if you do not accept as a priori time and space in a relational grid, then you're looking for something more foundational. And so to use a metaphor beneath repetition lies pure contingency. Is that supposed and, to be nothing? So the, the eternal return of difference is the fact from one instant to the next there's only the contingency of irreversible time and where he gets that is from the way that maimon solomon maimon challenges Kant, a challenge that Kant himself recognized as cogent. That the manifold is not structured a priori by time and space in a relational grid. but by the spontaneous emergence of relations between one cognitive object, whether thing or idea, and the next. So what Nietzsche's talking about from that perspective is, is what underlies, for example, what I was talking about with Kronecker doing the same thing with numbers between one and two. I mean, what is underneath the object? And what Nietzsche says, according to Deleuze, <laughs> is, Everything else is a human construct. There is nothing but pure contingency. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm not a philosopher. 
Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of Nietzsche. I've read even more Deleuze. Uh, that's what I think Deleuze is doing uh, then, with, with wait, Nietzsche. You, you would land into explosion, like a logical explosion, because that would embrace all contradictions. And er no, I can't accept that. No. I, I think I think Nietzsche would be all for logical explosions. <laughs> I'm sure he would. Um, no, they don't have any contained systems. You can't even have a paradigm. Right. Exactly. You can only yeah. have had a physical paradigm. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> just a different construction. That that's somebody's operating out of standard logic, Contro con uh, generating their own logic on top of that contingency. And that's what Duchamp is doing in that passage. I mean, that's really derived from, from pataphysics, that passage that I cited. Mm. That's pataphysical. All right, I'm gonna meditate on this for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Yeah, but like I say, I'm not a philosopher. So um, I, I don't know what David would say. Um, um okay well um i mean i as, as i understand it i i'm not i'm not i'm not sure about the relationship between deleuze and contingency at the level of the object i mean there's certainly um, as i understand from difference and repetition a, a, a an idea that the that the object actualizes from sub representational difference, difference that can't be in a sense uh, represented conceptually, say through negation, uh, which you can kind of, which you, you, you can associate with the virtual, but it's, I think in Deleuze, it's not completely random. It's, I mean, it's structured by ideas, you know, it's structured by, by, by um, well, I, I, I suppose what, what you call face bases, in fact, and, and, and sort of attractors and, uh, um, you know, points of condensation, which can be common to different, you know, quite disparate system. So there is a kind of Platonism in Deleuze, which kind of keeps the whole thing from being kind of just, just event, events randomly sprayed out in time. Uh, there, there is some kind of structure, you know, there is there, there are sort of structural principles. Uh, so I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not sure about, I, I mean, about about this idea of pure contingency that i guess there's an element of there, there's probably a stochastic element you know there there there, there are points where you know like you know so bifurcations where which in, in a sense there's that you you can't have any uh um which which are not sort of uh um which presumably can just happen but they're, 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 but it's precisely at those points in phase space where 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 bifurcations um, can be generated that they can occur. And obviously, you can have, you know, I'm just taking a, a simple, um, you know, uh, and 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 you you can have that with discrete processes as well, like logistic maps. You know, you can have certain. You know, certain control values. You can have sort of bifurcations all over the place, but there is still some kind of structural principle governing that. It's, it's, but they're from the bottom up rather than superimposed upon. Yeah, I mean, it can it can describe population dynamics, for example, or or uh, you know um, financial markets, uh, and you can certainly have you know that. But there are control. You know, but you you. You know the, the the bifurcations emerge at certain points when when you ramp up the say a control parameter. So it's not you know so that it, it, there's contingency, but it's contingency that's kind of um, sculpted, I guess by 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 phase spaces or by 
you know, ultimately by ideas in the Deleuzean sense. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, that's kind of, sorry, this is very spontaneous and that that's, that's as much as, that's kind of what I understand by Deleuzean contingency. And, and I would agree with you that the manifold of Deleuze is to phase space what Kant is to calculus. Yeah. Uh, but Nietzsche, I think, is really just talking about what lies beneath everything. Yeah. And, 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 uh, uh, but, you know, his book, Deleuze's book on Nietzsche is really wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I need to go back and reread it. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I guess, more into, more in terms of difference and repetition and, um, you know, particularly this idea of sub -rep you know, I mean, really difficult idea of sub-representational difference, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, the, how I got my dissertation topic was yeah. desperate to try to figure out how to, uh, how to uh, upgrade my MA French to PhD French. And someone suggested that I tr translate a chapter of difference from repetition. And I just had this moment of illumination. This is Prigogine. This, yeah. He's describing what Prigogine describes in terms of physical system. Yeah. And I think there's a correspondence there. Um, if you will, whether, whether you want to believe in natural law or not, it's certainly interesting from an analogical yeah. point of view. I think, I think it's, you know, as I said, I, I'm sure you're right. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, that the, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I even sort of grasp this notion of sub-representational difference. You know, I, I can just see that it's essential to Deleuze's whole approach, his, his contestation with Hegelianism. Um, the, you know, the, so it's, 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 it's difference that can't be reappropriated. It can't be reversed. <laughs> It can't, yeah. it can't be understood through negation in the sense you're just pitched into it. And in that sense, it, it underwrites the idea of the event and the encounter that you've been yeah. drawing. Uh, yeah. So um, how, now, how you can see, well, now you can see what Deleuze... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, now, I'm more um, sketchy on the sort of Ryman kind of um, sort of differential phase spaces. I mean, I... I always understood them as a kind of extension of the calculus, um, but in a sense, without kind of presupposing a sort of, you know, without with, yeah, well, I mean, with, you know, a way of sort of understanding curvature without sort of placing that curvature within a particular, um, uh, uh, a, a particular kind of neutral space, but my 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 grasp of Ryman is 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 very kind of sketchy, so I I, I won't say anything more. <laughs> well, well, this is why I think the connection between Kronecker and Poincaré is so interesting. Yeah, because Poincaré basically reduces starts from scratch with mathematics, and he reduces mathematics to the continuum and integers and the continuum emerges in the relation between one and two that's really interesting and phase space is really a modeling for a continuum for physical processes it's re that's really interesting and i'm i'm wondering i mean it does sound a lot like intuitionism uh the worry there might be that it's it seems to be a notion of the continuum which is kind of predicated on 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 a, on the kind of phenomenology of the continuum now maybe i'm wrong there and and that's where and that's where heidegger gets it too because heidegger yeah which is, is you know obviously contrasts say with the kind of set theoretical structuralism where you identify the continuum with the um uh the, the the power set of natural numbers, which is the kind of first, well, it's 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 uh, it, it's 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 uh, uh, it, it's it's not the it's not the, it's not the infinity of natural numbers, but the the kind of the the um, the one you get by if you like permutating that as a power set, 
Um, but I mean, for me, that's quite a powerful idea, pre precise because it's non-intuitable. And I'm, 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 and that's actually a worry I have with Deleuze, whether there is a kind of intuitionism kind of running through Deleuze, not, not in terms of givenness, but in terms of the understanding of continuity. Well, this is the large project which has got me in such knots. Mm. You know, partly because of my, the difficulty I'm having in doing work these days, but um, uh, I'm trying to construct a genealogy of Brigogine first by suggesting that you cannot separate irreversibility, imminence, and emergence and suggest that there's a genealogy which goes back through Bergson, through intuitionist mm. mathematics, to Maimon's critique of Kant, to Spinoza, mm. and then even further back to the, the chaos and redemption of Luria. Mm. And um, uh, so anyway, that's, that's the, you know, and given uh, the limits of my mathematical training and the limits of my philosophical training, um, uh, it's, it's been an interesting time trying, trying to, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that's, mm. so you, you've got, uh, uh, you're raising a problem, which is a problem. Yeah, it's a problem for, it's a problem for me. I guess it's a problem for anyone who's trying to, um, you know, reconstruct Deleuze anyhow. Yeah, yeah, how Deleuze do, is part of that. How do you, how do you deal with this kind of sub-representational yeah. dimension without, in a sense, falling back on some idea of structure, some kind of sort of... Uh, but yeah. the fact that Deleuze knew both Prigogine and Varela, I find really fascinating. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, cheers, Martin. I'll shut up now. I've gone on. I, I was just, I'm just going to kind no, of. No, great questions. Pop in and yeah. <laughs> um, inter uh, uh, interpolate, not, not expand. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Oh, I didn't mean to. I do have a kind of question that might, that might piggyback off some of this a little bit, if that's cool. Sure. Um, yeah. So I, I really loved everything. This is really. Super fascinating. Thank you so much for all this. And um, I was really interested in um, kind of the two examples um, of this, I think, like shock to the viewer that you're kind of talking about um, ontologically almost or something. Um, and sorry if I'm not precise. I'm not definitely not. I'm more of an artist myself than um, philosopher or anything along those lines. Um, but you're using Cage and Duchamp, who I think are kind of deploying this, this um yeah i'm not exactly sure what to call it but sort of like an interruption in this kind of calculus or kind of like um malaise i think that we fall back into ontologically that brings us into this like um scientific mode of experience or I, i'm not sure exactly again what to kind of classify it as but duchamp and cage cage kind of opens things up so like again in my understanding of deleuze this is almost like the becoming the body without organs kind of tactic or something, but it seems like what you're saying with Duchamp is it almost like closes it back in on the subject in this like infinite recursion. It makes your, yourself aware of yourself in this kind of pattern that, 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 that is a sort of structure that falls back on difference or, or um, an inability to fall back on itself almost. And like, that's the kind of like thing that's laid bare in that, installation is what I was kind of understanding. Maybe I'm a little off on this, but I'm wondering if you have other points of reference or like those kind of seem like two extremes on the pole of ways of dealing with this ontological structure. Like, um, and jazz, I think I, I probably should re read your book on jazz, I guess. Jazz seems like a whole kind of poetics maybe between that. And I'm wondering if you're, if you're finding other in, in the visual arts, other kind of points of departure or ways to employ this. Or again, I know you said you weren't that interested in or, or weren't equipped for, for the politics of it. But I liked the question earlier about how to deploy this institutionally, um, because I do think there's a huge, in the institutional arts, there's a, there's a huge um, 
problem, I almost think, with, with the inability to sort of address that within academia, within institutional structures, because they don't fit those kind of bounds of, of play or poetics or et cetera. Yeah, if that makes sense, hopefully, if there's a question there. I appreciate it. Your thoughts. Um, it, it seems like there's a, a lot of questions in there, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out which one to focus on first. Um, I only have four articles out on jazz. Um, I put a lot of work into them uh, and I've worked hard on it, but uh, the book is not out. So let's put that aside now. Um, when I do work, I'm following Deleuze's suggestion that we can only know philosophical concepts in relationship to scientific percepts and artistic constructs. And from each corner, it's the same. You know, we only know artistic constructs by reference to the science and philosophy of the age. So when I write, I tend to focus on one or a few scientists, one or two philosophers, one or two works of art. So, and I've done that, you know, uh, uh, with um, Pynchon in the, in the novel. Ezra Pound is a kind of counterexample in poetry. Um, John Cage, originally, and now Jazz. Um, Arako and Ginz, the avant-garde architects who were also artists. Uh, Kiki Smith's work. So I tend to try to keep my focus narrow to make the connections precise. So that's, in a sense, what I do. You know, different people will do different things, but. Um, I find creating cons constraints helps me to focus in deeper, I guess. Right. Does that help? Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I, I'm taking notes. I appreciate it. Uh, Ada, where is Ada? Is she still here? Hi, I'm still here. Hi. Hi. Um, you, you, uh, uh, referring to um, Kroniker and Brower in, in, in uh, Intuition is Mathematics. Say, why only the relationship between one and two and, and not, let's say, one and five? Mm -hmm. Well, before we can get to five, we have to go through two, three, and four. And we're just talking about the emergence in the mind of a mathematical object, one. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a deferring in time to the next mathematical object, which is two. And then there's a relation between the two. And that's what both Maimon uh, focuses on with things and ideas and what Maimon focuses on in this third category that he insists that mathematics is a form of cognition distinct from things and ideas. Uh, and so the mind thinking begins to count the integers, one, two, three. And for Kroniker, he strips the whole field of mathematics down to two things, integers and the continuum. And the continuum is what enables the relations. That, that's what emerges from those relations beneath the numbers. And so you can't get to one unless you go through two, three, four, and five. Once five exists or 10,005 or, you know, 
10 to the order of 20, um, then you can start forming other kinds of relationships. But in terms of the in terms of the genetics of mathematics in its generative nature, one and then two and then three and then four. Um, so if I understand you correctly, then so um, to conceptualize one and five, I really have to have like micro conceptions of the relationship between one and two, two and three, yeah. and three and four and four and five. Before you can talk about one and five, yeah. Okay, and this is. Um, it, it wouldn't be something that I would cognitively process. It would be like the subconscious, right? Because I don't really, if I'm talking about one and five, I really don't think about the relationship between the other numbers between one and five. Well, I, I certainly don't think about it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not a mathematician, but I, I think mathematicians do think about this. Uh, and that's why they become mathematicians because they, grab onto that form of, 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 cogn of, of cognitive objects. And then they begin manipulating them, so forth. Okay, thank you. There is a question right above uh, Adel's question by VD. Would you like to ask a question yourself or Martin you can take a look at it? Okay, so Emil, is that how you pronounce his name? No, the VD. You see that there's some through ready-made. Oh, now I just got it. But there's also something from Emil. Uh, uh, okay. Maybe I'll talk about that next. Uh, okay, so sure. let's look, let's look what VD says. Um, Duchamp through ready-mades takes away the agency from the human subject that is the artist, the producer of the work of art. There are innumerable possibilities opening up, giving the way to contingency. The breaking of the glass is a way of completion of the work of art, for example. But in the end, all his art is still directed towards the perceivings and self-reflecting human subject in all its conventional sense that dwells through dualities, uh, one that is to consume the work of art, similar in chess, unaccountable possibilities, but in the end, only a dualistic determination, one either wins or loses. Uh, I'm not sure that I would disagree with that at all, except to suggest that once you move from one to two, uh, you have what's called structural coupling. And structural coupling is just one way that you get to distributed cognition. So in order to get to distributed cognition, you have to be able to establish relations between two subjects, as in a chess game. But Duchamp also talks about art reception. And that's where we move from a structural coupling relationship to a distributed process that occurs through time which has to do with acceptance, rejection, reputation, so forth. And that's the long scale version of uh, the issue that you're talking about in terms of So that's that's how you move to beyond a, a, a dualistic determination. So there's both the, the the confrontation between the artist and the observer at a particular moment in time, which is the encounter. But then through time, then you have the community. 
and that's where art becomes a distributed cognitive process of acceptance, acceptance and rejection. Is that, uh, uh, do you have a follow-up from, from that? Uh, Hara, Hara had to go. She had to go? Yeah, yeah, she left. She sent oh, okay. a message saying that, thank you, but she okay. needed to. <laughs> well, she missed my really great answer, so. No, no, I think she heard you, and it's really, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Okay, so em Emil, is that how you pronounce his name? Is he here? Emile, Levesque, Yalbert. I, I can't pronounce, I'm sorry. He says, Deleuze describes the point of rupture as the irrational cut that appears to have meaning for its own sake in cinema's faux record. At the same time, he defines irrational on the basis of irrational numbers and Foucault's thought of the outside. If I understand your point correctly, it is that, that the encounter and the game of exposure and delay are happening as a form of interiority and more so a configuration of internalized consciousness. So my question would be, how does Deleuze's emphasis on life and creativity as capture forces from the outside fit or does not fit in your reading of Duchamp's exposure and delay? Um, I'd have to think about that. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I would, I, th I think Deleuze is definitely influenced by Duchamp. Uh, on a number of levels. But you're also bringing in the cinema books. And the difference between Nietzsche's vital, vitalism and Bergson's. Um, uh, the problem with me talking about Bergson's vitalism is that I don't see him as a metaphysician. I see him as a materialist, even though he uses the word metaphysics. And the reason why I say that is because I think he's working out of a, a materialism based on um, imminence. And that's certainly something that people might argue with. If, if that makes sense. Um, so emphasis on life and create Deleuze's emphasis on life and creativity as capture of forces from the outside. Um, I would have to unpack that and look at the passages. I don't think I agree with that characterization of Deleuze but I, I would need to think about that much more carefully than I can here. So my apologies for that. Uh, two mo new messages down here. Oh, just somebody having, having to go. A anything else? I'm going, I, you can have a question. I think that's it. Yeah, but I, um, I'm a bit out of the mathematics, uh, super high level of discussion. So I, I, rest, I restrain a bit. It's because as, as an artist, I'm taking this whole talk as a means to, to produce and to act. And so I'm not much on the philosopher mathematician side, which I, I, I highly admire. But I, I would like to ask, propose you um, or ask you what 
how do you foresee because the institution have, have been deeply modified by, by Duchamp as a, a means to induce power within the walls, within the structure of how art is manifested. And so, so the, the effect is made, so, but we, we will never redo this kind of, of same paradigm shift. So I'm worried about the next paradigm shift and I'm, I'm highly because these kind of talks, I, I love them, but they, they, makes, they make me deeply anxious. Not, not negatively anxious, but they make me anxious about my power to produce paradigm shift and to produce big mistakes. And so, and so here we are with the technology being able to witness art and, at a higher speed. I, I feel speed is, is very important right now because you don't only see one, you, you are not only witnessing one artwork that produced this kind of self-reflection mirroring of your inner self. You see a thousand of them each day. And so at an higher rate. And, and this, this rate, this stress of re-inducing self-consciousness feels like sometimes sometimes it's a one parameter of a certain violence of um, of uh, continuing this game this game of chess and so i would like you to know maybe we we have been a lot on, in the past but what do you think about the jazz of the future about the this intermingling of tomorrow uh I really haven't thought about the jazz of the future because I find it so difficult to try to articulate what jazz is like in the present. Uh, but there's something that jazz musicians know that the rest of us need to understand, I think. And that is they cultivate deliberately cognitive bifurcation. in the context of a kind of imminence, which within the individual is called flow and amongst individuals distributed is called groove. And they spend a lifetime cultivating the capacity to cognitively bifurcate within multiple dimensions, melody, harmony, harmonic rhythm, and percussive rhythm. And those bifurcations exist in all dimensions at every moment, the potential for bifurcation. And they're all aware of it. And they're all paying attention really intensely and so their response to each other at very fast cognitive speeds must necessarily occur beneath the, the threshold of conscious awareness. And the fact that they're cultivating this, and not only that, one might argue that the usual gap between conscious cognition and unconscious cognition gets dissolved here. The conscious cognition that goes on in the practice room must necessarily exist on the bandstand. For example, I experienced it as, as uh, an incompetent novice player um, starting up again, having quit for 30 years when I was starting to play around in the Pittsburgh area, where I would be practicing all these possibilities for improvising over like uh, Charlie Parker's Blues for Alice, for example. And I would come up with all these possible melodic ideas. And then in the process of superimposing that from the top down onto that musical moment, I've stopped listening to what the other people are doing. And I've also, for example, lost track of where I am in the song form. 
And one of the things that I discovered, I, I, I found a way to describe was the cognitive dissonance between fast and slow forms of cognition. Very slow forms of cognition, which enable you to maintain the frame of the song form. Very fast cognition, which enables you to interact in terms of all these cognitive bifurcations in these different dimensions in response to what the other players are doing at very fast cognitive speeds beneath the threshold conscious awareness. But when you talk to experienced players, they talk about this capacity to witness and the fact that these different forms of time cognition, cognition at different speeds, are, ex are existing simultaneously, and they are able to maintain awareness of all these levels. That the, 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 in another, the mind is a multiplicity, and jazz musicians know that better than anybody because they experience it. And the, the more experience you have, the more all of that becomes conscious. So there's continuity of cognition hmm. at fast and slow speeds. That's absolutely amazing. And it's, it's hard to believe that that's going on, but that's what's going on. They are able to experience the mind cognizing the world at different speeds at the same time. Mm -hmm. That would be a nice translation for the the body without organs. It's more. It will be more a, a multi-dimensional organ body, or you will switch the the organistic architecture yeah. of a body to a a, a vectorial yeah. stacking of the. Well, I think you would love the work of Francisco Barella, actually, and I think it's the connection between Deleuze and and and, uh, and Varela that got me here. Mm -hmm at least in terms of the, these issues. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So we are uh, over two hours and a half. And uh, thank you so much, Martin, for the amazing, amazing talk. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was well, really wonderful to re revisit this work. Uh, this was my uh, most, uh, a good hunk of this stuff was my dissertation work. Um, uh, one, one aspect of my dissertation work, um, uh, both the discovery of the connection between Feynman diagrams and plot trajectories in Gravity's Rainbow, as well as this connection between Poincaré and, and Duchamp came out of my dissertation. And this, this uh, discussion of post-humanism and grand narratives enabled me to suggest that th some of these issues that uh, that post-humanist philosophers, critical post-humanists uh, or meta-humanists or whatever you uh, want to refer to, um, uh, that this was already these issues were already at work in the avant-garde strain of high modernism. So I hope that was um, uh, useful. Yes, for sure. Hopefully, uh, we can continue this talk later if you are available in like different forums, maybe like reading groups or more like lectures. Looking forward uh, to have yeah. more more of this discussion with you. As David knows, these are exhausting, and I'm, you know my health has been kind of frail lately. So let me think about it. It's something I, I really would like to do. I'm not sure that I have the energy to. Yeah, know. yeah. If you if you if you feel comfortable, uh, also thank you so much, David. Thanks everyone for contributing to this discussion, and um, and the feedback's been great. Nice. Really, really yeah. great questions. Really yeah, great. Questions. I really got a lot. There's a lot to chew over from this, Martin. Thank you so much. Really, you know, coming from you, David. No, no. I, I, I think I. I but I don't. I, but don't tell you I said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.